So now we are live. At least that's the assumption. Welcome to the to the panel, making more from less. Uh, this is definitely the most important panel of the entire Horace's extraordinary meeting. Making more from less is exactly what we need to make sure that the economies that we all depend on keep growing within the environmental constraints of one. So far, it's just one planet. Um, I'm Kira Lichtman. I am Vice President for Global Initiatives at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. Uh, I have the honor of leading the, the U.S. Chamber's international sustainability efforts, including resource efficiency task force and our U.S. business representation at the Resource Efficiency Alliance of G7 and Dialogue of G20. Uh, these are important right. conversations that policymakers are having right now, but they were all started before the pandemic crisis. Mr. Sinha, thank you for joining us. We just started. Uh, before the pandemic crisis, many companies were looking at environmental constraints and thinking about the risks to their business how to adjust to possible supply disruptions. But after the pandemic, we've all experienced what the reality might be, how abrupt the disruption might be, and how difficult it is to prepare for the actual risks that are inherent in dealing with the environment. Uh, the way... Use of natural resources, especially finite natural resources, uh, and uh, your perspective on what policy solutions can be helpful, either nationally or at the global. Scale. And we'll have a round of questions and take comments from the audience. Um, Stephen Stephen Brinkemeyer is the chairman of the European Climate Foundation and somebody who understands business extremely well both from the climate perspective and finite resources. I'd like to start with you and ask you to comment how you see the, the obvious fragility of the human-to-environment relationship right now and uh, what, are, what are the lessons that we should be trying to draw from the way that our economies have turn, turned out to be so vulnerable uh, to the environmental shock. Stephen? Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much, Gary. Um, I think there are many lessons uh, that we can learn. Obviously, one of which is uh, be better prepared, because obviously we know that, <clears throat> that the German government in 2012 made a very substantial assessment of what would happen if a pandemic would hit. The same the UK government did in 2016. What would happen if a pandemic would hit? But nobody did anything. And then the pandemic hit. And then obviously everybody uh, was overwhelmed. I think Germany still, without pre preparation, actually faced, fared much better than the UK or France or other countries. And uh, so I think uh, uh, there's a big lessons uh, to be learned. Uh, we, draw the con we draw the conclusion as well that we say, uh, obviously, we know what is going to happen if we don't act in regard of the climate crisis, climate emergency. We know exactly what needs to be done. The scientists are very clear what needs to be done. And uh, we talk to business, talk to industry, talk to social society, talk to faith groups, what needs to be done. We've got plans in hand, but, but obviously uh, we seem still to be reluctant to do things. And uh, so I think, I think there are a lot of lessons uh, in that, that regard that we actually can be better prepared. And obviously, on the other hand, obviously a lot of, ish, a lot of things are happening. And uh, two days ago, I had a very interesting discussion with the head of Greenpeace UK, who told me about a uh, discussion he had with the CEO of BP, who came to see him. 
And uh, usually you would think that an NGO goes to see the CEO of such a big major oil and gas company, but he came to see him. And he said, obviously, we fought BP for many years about all, all different aspects. But now they're asking us for advice. They really are engaging with us. They shared with us their strategic plan. And where Greenpeace said, actually, that is a very substantial plan. And BP is really way ahead of anybody else in that industry. And uh, so I think that is a very good sign that people like the CEOs of BP. He also had the CEO of Tesco with him who also came to see him. Similar discussion. So I think uh, that people are finally listening and also starting to make moves in that direction. So in that sense, I think there are areas there where, I'm, as, as we often say, we are stubbornly optimistic, like Christiana Figueres often, often says. So I think there's a lot of still positivity out there. But we daily read about disasters like in Greenland, the melting of the ice, ice, uh, ice uh, bergs, etc. And But still, we know what we can do, what we have to do. And uh, I think... Uh, Again, that also gives phenomenal investment opportunities. And uh, I believe strongly that if Biden is elected, that he really puts $2 trillion into, into climate action. And uh, I think, I hope if he's elected, that on the 6th of November, uh, when they officially would leave the Paris Agreement, that he will overturn this. And uh, he could potentially do this. The, the, the election is on the 3rd. So on the sixth, he potentially could do this, but I don't know whether that's practical. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, and um, and I think we know what we need to do. Stephen, thank you. I won't comment on U.S. presidential elections, no, but I don't want to make a point that the U.S. Chamber supports us rejoining or not leaving the Paris Accord. So the business community is united in that aspect. Um, I want to move uh, to Gunjan Singh. Gunjan, uh, as a, the leader of Met, uh, Metric Stream, you are at a very pragmatic level uh, measuring, helping companies measure their risks, uh, external risks, regulatory compliance risks. In the current situation when the governments have had to respond to emergencies and uh, are finding it very difficult to find a growth path, Many companies are worrying about how to to project uh, for the future, what to expect. It's a potentially very difficult, uncertain future for companies. As somebody who helps measure and manage uh, the risks, uh, what, what's your sense of where we're heading, especially in terms of our relationship with environmental policies, regulations, or maybe opportunities? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And uh, firstly, apologize. Uh, I had uh, difficulty getting in to this uh, digital world uh, of this uh, process event, but I'm glad I'm here. Nice meeting you all. And, you know, we are living in an extraordinary time, right, with what's going on all, all around us. And I think at some level, you know, one of the biggest risk events in human history is right in front of us as we look at this pandemic and how things have shaped. And as the executive chairman of Metric Stream, looking at risk management and really working with a large number of regulators and policymakers and governments, as well as businesses, we have had numerous opportunities to look into this whole aspect of how the world is preparing itself for various elements of risks. And we've done a good job, for example, starting to get some handle around financial risks that I call the first wave of risk. We've had a lot of technologies, a lot of innovation go around what I call digital and cyber risks, cybersecurity, cyber warfare, and so all of those stuff. Uh, and now there's a whole discussion around biological, you know, pandemic and other kinds of risks. But the risk that really has to be now put on the forefront is the planetary risk, the risk around the climate. And a lot of companies are now beginning to think about systems proactively they put in place to make these things happen, but also creating governance 
like for example a number of boardrooms we are seeing the norm gov committees of these boards not the risk committee but the norm gov committee which is looking at things proactively is actually making this as part of their mandate so the risk committee looks at when the risk happens but the norm gov committee of a, let's say a global 5000 company is now looking at these things happening proactively as part of the corporate governance or esg primitive so i expect specific programs specific systems and people figuring out as companies what can they do for planetary health how can they think about innovation to solve the problems in terms of reducing carbon footprint deploying technologies for things like carbon sequestration or even looking at more fundamental changes in the footprint that people businesses or their employees might have in terms of their global hectare you know uh, kind of measurements so all of for example at metric stream we worry about is how do you measure things because if you start to measure things you can help to start to improve things and i think it all starts with measurements and and i think we need to begin as a society to measure and then put the right governance and policy frameworks around it gary so i'm optimistic that the world is recognizing in the next 5 years to take the the leap into the planetary side despite you know i'm sitting here in california with wildfires i can barely see outside there's a lot of yeah. you know haziness in the sky but it is the world which tells us that we need to awaken to this reality and this is the reality that we we've got to solve in our own lifetimes kunjan that's very optimistic and coming from you who is watching the metrics very carefully that's encouraging um none of that would happen without market forces being fully at play so it takes me to debra debra is somebody who's been leading the competitiveness con uh, council of the united states and now I understand global federation how do you see the connection between the extraordinary challenges that companies are facing and the cost of transition to more sustainable work more sustainable um practice regulatory pressure and yet the need to remain competitive you have to compete with those who may not follow the same rules or maybe in a different position what what is the key connecting competitiveness with sustainability and what is public policy for that thank you gary well let me just start by saying that competitiveness is all about building a sustainable prosperous future for your citizens and of course in the global federation of competitiveness councils we're focused on how we're doing this in a global context so really the three building blocks for a competitiveness future are advancing the innovation capacity capacity the resiliency and sustainability and i will just share that the other day the us council held an incredible webinar on the new face of resiliency when we released our report transform 2020 and resiliency is something that is directly related to sustainability and it is not being built neither of these are being built into the fabric of a company and enterprise's core operations and i i want to come back to that but let me just make a comment of of optimism of where we could go in the future because at the end of the day you know making by consuming less is really a productivity equation and i don't think it should be approached from the perspective of scarcity a scarcity model would be very dangerous for the world it would raise energy uh, security further as a lever of geopolitics it would pit nations against each other for possessions of resources we already see this going on in the uh, rare earth materials field it would raise consumer prices higher it would really stall growth in emerging economies and really in my view hamper the poverty eradication of the developed world the exciting prospect is that because of a whole convergence of new technologies coming together we have the potential now to move the world from sustainability as an imperative and from scarcity to abundance and this could impact every sector of the economy from agriculture Energy, water, the built environment, and very importantly, how we make, move, and consume things. And the U.S. Council on Competitiveness has launched a major national commission on innovation and competitiveness frontiers, 
And one of the whole areas that we have developed some very powerful recommendations that will be released in December is around the future of production and sustainable consumption. And of course, we know in energy that we're really moving rapidly to the deployment of renewables, moving to a low and zero carbon world. Uh, nuclear power is coming back on the scene in many nations, including, it's interesting, this is a big part of the platform for uh, uh, Vice President Biden's campaign. Hydrogen economy is moving forward. This is tremendously exciting. We see in agriculture, you know, the whole use of biotechnology now to create high precision agriculture that reduces water and waste and the use of chemicals such as nitrogen. And then, of course, you know, smart manufacturing production is taking huge amounts of uh, wasteful materials and really moving to a cradle to cradle manufacturing system. And I, I would say also that, you know, part of this optimism of moving to a uh, innovation driven future that's one of abundance, not scarcity, is that we're really now entered into the bioeconomy and biofabrication is going to be a huge player in how we build sustainability into all of our operations. And I'll, I'll just leave this. I know we'll come back to some questions. You look at how back in the 1980s, for the first time, corporations really began to focus on safety as a core component of their operations. And companies such as DuPont and Unilever and others built safety into all their operations. The next wave of this was total quality management. And the Japanese led that. But at a certain point, by the late 80s, if you did not have total quality management in your operations, you weren't in business. And I would posit that that's where we are in terms of sustainability and the circular economy. That will become a platform for every business activity. And if it's not built in and endorsed and supported at the level of corporate governance, those firms, large, small, medium, emerging, will not be in business. So there's a tremendous optimistic opportunity for the future. And business is really going to lead this because it makes sense for their productivity. It makes sense for their customers. And it makes sense for the planet on which we're all living going forward. Deborah, thank you. Well, Barker, we talked about industry and innovation. That takes us directly to your company. Uh, the aluminum industry seems to be, first of all, it's hugely dependent on energy supply. And therefore, I think you've been forced to innovate probably more than many other industries. And hopefully something good is coming out of that. From your experience running uh, in plus and uh, also as a former climate negotiator, what is new, what is emerging in such fundamental resource intensive and energy intensive industry as aluminum uh, manufacturing? Um, good morning and great to uh, join you on this very distinguished panel. Um, Yes, the, the aluminium industry is fascinating. I, w I was in, been involved in uh, the climate change agenda as a former climate change minister under David Cameron for, for many years. And it came as a, uh, you know, it hadn't always been my plan to end up leading the world's largest producer of low carbon aluminium um, and uh, also the world's largest producer in the private sector of hydropower. Um, but the reason that I'm here is because there is such an uh, opportunity to have and make a real impact and genuinely move the dial in one of the big hard to abate industries. The United Nations has identified seven of the big industrial sectors, uh, iron, steel, chemicals, etc., um, including aluminium, seven hard, hard to abate sectors that we really have to move to a low carbon model um, in order for the global economy to meet those important, vital uh, Paris goals on climate change to get us to uh, net zero and keep global warming below one and a half degrees. Um, but the aluminium industry um, is interesting because in, a, in many ways it has been part of the circular economy, part of sustainable manufacturing long before people were re had invented the term or were even thinking in that way. The reason being that aluminium is almost infinitely recyclable and it's the polar opposite of plastics where, 
you know, just a fraction of the plastic that is um, uh, produced each year is is uh, retrieved, and, uh, let alone recycled. Something like 75% of all the aluminium that's ever been produced in the modern industrial era, 75% of total production, is still in circulation. Um, that's why it's such a great resource. However, um, and that's why it's considered green and sustainable. However, you put your nail on the, you hit the nail on the head in your question. It is also incredibly in, uh, energy intensive. Now, as well as being recyclable, it's also vital um, in the low carbon economy for electric vehicles. You need it for um, sustainable housing because of its thermal qualities. It's widely used in renewable energy, both for infrastructure and also for uh, devices. 80 percent or so of a solar panel is actually uh, made up of aluminium. But it's incredibly energy intensive to create. Um, now, if you use clean energy as your primary energy input, it has a transformational impact. So for the the um, t majority of the world's aluminium, which is comes from China, about 60 percent, that is um, primarily made with coal fired electricity. And as a result, it, you use 16 and a half tons of carbon to create just one ton of aluminium. But if you switch out coal and use a clean energy, in our case, hydropower, then that requires just two and a half tons of carbon to create one ton of aluminium. So absolute number one, it's like every other sector of the economy. You have to bear down on coal and replace it with a plentiful renewable energy source or clean en clean energy source because it requires so much you can't just rely on intermittent uh, renewables you do need a, a large dependable base load that's why hydro in our case is is perfect and actually there is huge potential for the world's hydro resources to be tapped further um in in our case on on lake baikal probably only we produce 16 gigawatts a year of hydroelectricity but we've probably only tapped 20 to 30 percent of the potential of that particular resource so the big challenge for the sector is to get off coal and but then if you're if we're going to um follow through and meet that uh, and land in that net zero future there also has to be some fundamental change in the technology and we're working uh on uh technological development that would actually change the way that we actually smelt aluminium to create a carbon negative uh, product, um, as well as looking to take um, uh, um, uh, the carbon out of the whole production chain. Now, the, the, unfortunately, our sector has been relatively slow to embrace this. I'd love to say that everyone's got with the program and uh, are as equally enthusiastic as I am. That's not um, the case. There are some signs that um, there have been some very good sustainability initiatives, but on carbon, we need to move at much greater pace and scale. And I think that the, first of all, the, the most important thing that we can do as a sector is to be much more transparent about our carbon footprint. So in order to, you know, it's the old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So in order to drive that, um, I'm leading a uh, an initiative to try and get the London Metal Exchange um, to display the carbon content of all the metals that are traded uh, on its platform and to sort of set a new code for um, for global aluminium. And that shouldn't be voluntary. That should be mandatory. And there's actually a consultation out and uh, hopefully a, you know, that will come next year. But even if it is um just voluntary to begin with. I think there is such a, uh, as previous colleagues were saying in the panel before me, there is now such a tide, such a demand for low carbon product and such a shift from investors, from financiers and uh, customers demanding greater transparency and a shift to a low carbon economy. I think it will become unstoppable. Um, but as I say, fundamentally, aluminium has a huge amount to offer the low carbon economy. That's music to my ears, my by first education, I'm a non ferrous metallurgical engineer. So <laughs> well, you know, be a lot about it now. <laughs> um 
uh, Henrietta Kekalainen, and um, we've heard uh, from from other panelists uh, about the attempts to reduce carbon emissions and, and the importance of climate policy. Obviously, carbon capture has been emerging over the last three four years as uh, a ray of hope. Uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, we saw the G20 seminar for the first time on carbon circular economy run by our Saudi colleagues, uh, which was an attempt to put some policy framing around that. Um, carbon culture, what can you tell us about your view about this issue? Uh, what's needed, where the innovation lies? And again, going back, what do governments need? Do, to make sure that companies who are willing to invest in sustainability remain competitive. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Great to be here. Uh, really interesting uh, backgrounds and organizations that everybody has. Um, so yes, Carbo Culture, I'm the CEO and co-founder, and we do carbon removal or carbon drawdown in, in other words. So basically what we do is we make high purity activated biocarbons uh, from waste and, and that captures the carbon for, in our case, over a thousand years. So essentially, instead of trying to capture the carbon from the atmosphere with a mechanical solution or a chemical solution, we let nature do that work and we transform the biomass into, into a stable form, almost graphitic carbon. And, and like Lord Barker was mentioning, like, uh, the, the carbons that we can displace, such as activated carbons, can have a footprint of 21 tons or something to the ton. So they're horribly pollutive sometimes. Uh, and what we can do is not just uh, bring in a carbon neutral material, but actually it's a carbon reducing uh, material because the process itself is carbon negative. So this is one of the ways that the IPCC has highlighted that we can we can physically bring down carbon from the atmosphere. So I think there's two things that we need to remember kind of like as the realities. One is of course that it's getting hot in here. Uh, there's too much too much carbon in the atmosphere that warms quicker than air. So then we're seeing consequences such as in California, my co-founder's house almost burning down three weeks ago, uh, which is quite crazy. Um, nobody expected these things to happen so quickly, but here we are. Um, so first of all, it's getting too hot. We need to stop putting carbon in the atmosphere and we need to also physically bring some down. Uh, and there's a there's a very big difference in that and companies are understanding that now as well, that it's not enough to just avoid certain emissions. That's what every company should be doing right now. But also we need to get to net zero. And like Deborah was mentioning, I think I think being CO2 neutral is the new safety. And any company that's not considering being CO2 neutral by 2030 is really out of the game because there will be a new category where everybody needs to be above that line to be considered uh, good quality. And that's not just software cor corporations that are doing that. Also, uh, I think two days ago, Finnish corporation Connect Cranes that do elevators and, and big, big hardware um, also announced their, their targets. So, so it's a really interesting time. Um, and of course, the second scientific reality is the consumption and, and just not being able to replenish the resources on, on this planet. Um, I think for us, uh, the carbon market has been amazing. The voluntary, voluntary carbon market that has emerged from the leadership of such companies as Microsoft and the first movers in these areas. And, and there, the carbon price can even be higher than the ETS trading price, which to us uh, is really, really invaluable in our business model and getting to scale in this carbon, carbon sequestration. And I think that government should also start start uh, thinking of how they can how they can support climate early stage climate technologies. Um, I know some countries in Europe have massive climate funds, but they're lacking political decisions or something else and taking months on end and and being strangled in, in 
kind of like bureaucracy that shouldn't be stopping climate change, which is a scientific problem, not a political one. Um, yes. And another thing is that I think when we're talking about raw materials, there should be a level playing field and the sustainable ones should not be working three times as hard as the non-sustainable ones. So, so really the level playing field would mean that the ones who are not as sustainable get taxed for it. And this is, I think, what we need to come to if we want to have drastic, drastic changes in, in how we do make materials on, on this planet uh, in the coming years, which is obviously necessary. Thank you, Henrietta. I, I wanted to move uh, on to a little bit towards uh, natural resources that unlike climate, um, which is not the resource, but the, the condition we live in, but natural resources that are at the foundation of our economic growth. And you all touched on it. Deborah mentioned bioeconomy. Lord Barker mentioned the, the uh, RLC. And obviously every company touches that uh, in different ways. Next year is the Conference of the Parties on Biodiversity. And one of the challenges we see is that it's very difficult to put some metrics around our impact on ecosystems through biodiversity lens. It's very difficult to assess the risks from either being too close to nature and having zoonotic viruses jump over with something else, or impact on very complex systems who are the foundation of livelihood for other population. Um, lots of difficult, difficult policy decisions and difficult corporate decisions are connected to exhaustible resources, including biodiversity, but not limited to it, right? So I would like to see if uh, anyone wants to comment on that, how you think about that, what are the risks in that space? Uh, even assuming we do everything right in terms of the climate change, we're still going to run into the challenge of making more from less. And we need to be making more because so, so many of, uh, so you know, many countries still need to have room for growth. How to make sure that they also have access to natural resources while being able to plot their development in a more sustainable way. Now, setting climate aside for a second, because it's obvious we have consensus on the climate side. Um, anyone wants to comment on that? Uh, yes, please, uh, uh, Gunjan. So let me, let me kick it off. And, you know, I'm a technology optimist, you know, where I live and, you know, to every problem in the world, there's one one solution that's called technology. And I do believe that, you know, there are approaches where we can indeed do more with less on the very specific topic about natural resources that you were touching on, a very critical one. You know, we have to start to reimagine the world in which we live. You know, if you look at, for example, our land mass, you know, that's a small fraction. The rest of it is all ocean, for example. And, and you've got to start to think about the ocean as an asset. And how do you develop a, a, a system, a biodiversity system that actually plays on the ocean? So, for example, one of the companies I was an early uh, in, uh, in involvement with is a company called C6 Energy, which is building an operating system for the ocean in terms of how you can do ocean farming and how you can create algaes and other kinds of biodiversity to kind of start to change. So there is looking at the, the resource base in a broader sense, looking at the land mass and the water mass, and the water mass is a critical one because, believe it or not, most of the planet is water, and we need to start to understand that. So I want us to think a little bit in an open-minded way and look at the planet in its totality to just provoke the conversation. That's very important. And uh, by the way, uh, two weeks ago at the meeting of G20 environmental ministers, that was one of the top subjects of the discussion and they could not agree on anything. So they've decided to continue this conversation without private sector participation. Yeah. Um, so we, we will be trying to break that mold. And, yeah, uh, and our approach is... 
and our approach here in Silicon Valley is, you know, we don't wait. We just, you know, launch companies, you know, so I have four or five initiatives going, you know, with metric stream as umbrella from risk management. But whether you look at C6 energy or whether you look at what we're doing on planetary health, or I'm actually in the process of creating something with an organization in DC called rare.org, which is an organization, which is an environmental organization. We are, we are creating a whole system for carbon counting. We call it carbon counts. And so I think as you look at the world and you apply technology to the whole planet in its resource framework, you can start to get to what was being discussed in terms of carbon sequestration and other kinds of primitives. So I think looking at the entire resource base is going to be one way to be having a fresh look here. Gary. Thank you. A systemic approach is very important. Deborah from California to Washington. Deborah, you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Still, yeah. Oh, you know, nobody yeah. mentioned the concept of the blue economy of actually generating value from something that didn't exist before. And, and that's also at the heart of this biofabrication movement. Um, it's very strong in the United States. National laboratories such as Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Lawrence Livermore, others are really at the forefront of this with many universities. And I will say in Europe that one of the great centers for the sustainability of natural products related to the ocean is Catholica University in Portugal that has one of the major partnerships called the Blue Atlantic that I think, uh, and Isabel Gill, who's the rector, usually participates in the Horasis meeting in Cascais, so we'll meet her next year. But the other thing I want to mention um, on the natural resource issue and the energy is, you know, sorry, I, could I could I interrupt hydrogen. just for, could I just interrupt a moment because that's really interesting. Could you just explain ex a little more detail because I'm not really familiar with this concept. Could you tell me, give me a practical example of what it what it might? Yeah, be? so that, so the really green economy and is really where you're almost taking a status quo position. You're doing things mm. in a sustainable way. The blue economy is creating something that didn't exist before. So it's just, for instance, when you harvest fog, you create water that didn't exist before in terms of it going into the system. When you use algae, you know, as a form of fuel, and that's, there's a lot of work on that in aerospace, you know, you're replicating and creating something that just in the individual algae cell was static. So the blue economy is really much more dynamic and building than the green economy. And that's why in the United States, I mean, we kind of make fun of the companies that claim they're green when they're not producing anything like you are in the aluminum industry. It's very easy to be green when you're, you know, a software company. But, of course, yeah. they evaluate the non-green uh, use of materials and things and huge servers and the electronics that use very environmentally uh, disastrous rare earth materials that are produced in the most environmentally nasty ways. I mean, we should really have a field trip to go to a rare earth factory in China if you want to talk about sustainability and how it impacts the electronics industry of the future. But what I did want to say, in addition to all of us pushing out on this hydrogen economy, which is totally revolutionary, is we need to now have universal electrification and universal access to high-speed broadband. And the COVID-19 crisis has brought this to the forefront in a huge way. It's a major issue of inequity, of social injustice and everything. When children have to be educated this way now, they don't have access to the core infrastructure. So I'm thinking now we're very creative about a lot of ways to deal with this in the United States. It's ridiculous. We have rural areas that do not have broadband coverage. But for a long time now, we've allowed the growth of the Internet to be regulated free and tax free. So I'm of the view now that we should be saying net neutrality is finished. It's obsolete. We need net quality. And if we get universal broadband and universal access to everyone, we're going to unleash a huge amount of innovation. And I know that's a little bit away from the question on materials. But it will also drive the innovation in materials. We do not need rare earth materials anymore. We need to create synthetic materials that will have these functions, not going into our earth and damaging it to the extent we are. Uh, can I add to that? 
<laughs> Can I add to the innovation? I was just talking to, to one of my mentors who's a, uh, a founder of a biotechnology company and has raised several more rounds than me and everything. Um, we were just speaking and, and he's now left that company and started a different biotechnology company. And I think what's really exciting to me in the kind of like bio startup space is that there's a new breed of entrepreneurs who actually have started to understand the language of biology. And that's really important for, for the whole sustainability on the, on the biosphere side, when people start to understand what do, how do things interlink and what can we actually do? Because I think that the best innovations are not going to be trying to control nature in any way. We suck at that. And frankly, we do more bad things than good things. Uh, it's very visible anywhere, anywhere we look today. So instead, just trying to work with the leverage that nature can provide and these bioprocesses can provide, and maybe then we can make a planet that's not utterly, um, yeah, damaged once we to leave this game. Yeah, the aluminum industry is hugely dependent on hydropower generation, and obviously that has an extraordinary impact on the ecosystems around water. From your industry perspective, how would your industry grow uh, in an environmentally sustainable way, given the fact that you have to use, well, at least in the foreseeable future, a lot of water? I think you are on the music. Quick, quick, quick on the thing to un unmute myself. Um, I think there's a huge difference in the type of hydro. So if you're talking about flooding a tr uh, rainforest basin or if you're talking about a three gorge dam that's very different to the sort of um uh, hydro system that we operate um in on lake baikal where we actually play a role in regulating the f the um the uh, flows out of the lake to prevent to prevent flooding it's a very stable ecosystem um, but that's not the case everywhere so i think um, there's no uh, magic formula. You just have to um, apply a very high ecological and uh, environmental threshold, and you have to have very clear sustainability reporting. We've done a lot of work with the World Wildlife Fund of Russia in the custodianship of uh, Lake Baikal. But hydropower itself is a very, very important resource. And in particular, um, the potent we're you know, exploring the potential for converting some of that into hydrogen. Um, the part of the problem is to get hydrogen from places where it's a, it could be abundant, say like Lake Baikal, to the points where it needs to be actually deployed in industrial centers is not simple. So we need to not just work out how we use it, but how we transport it safely, because it is a very, very um, combustible uh, material, but you know that's not impossible. Um, so I think you know there's there's no, no um, secret uh, special source here. You know the best thing for that this whole uh, eco climate agenda is transparency and accountability uh, at every single level, right the way through the supply chain. If I may add something to yeah. the polluting industries. Bring Duncan Meyer back into the conversation. Henrietta? That just a quick comment that that uh, there are there are of course solutions today, but there's also solutions in the pipeline for tomorrow. And there's a lot of companies that are working on uh, small scale nuclear that can be used for weapons or different sorts of energy energy forms that would be zero carbon and those are those are teams of twenty people in a laboratory today, but they could reach scale quite quickly if they had the capital and the the kind of market ready for them and I think that big corporations who have a lot of uh, a lot of funds in the reserve could easily uh, chip into to these types of projects and potentially find find a way to transition entirely uh, faster. Yeah. Yeah, can, I, yeah, can I add something? I just uh, add that, yeah. You know, following on that comment, that in terms of using sustainable energy in new and creative ways, um, the U.S. military is really in a leadership role. 
they are moving very, very fast to net zero carbon in how ships are being powered. Of course, there's the nuclear Navy, but also out in the field and the innovation. You know, we often know that in unfortunately in a in a military environment, we see huge innovations in medical care and how uh, medicines and all of that from, you know, the, the solving of yellow fever when the Panama Canal was built. But on energy and sustainability, U.S. military and I think other partners around the world are making huge strides. And it's also where the government, in partnership with the private sector, can really take a leadership role through the power of procurement, that they're going to procure products and services and capabilities that are sustainability sustainable and drive that through the economy, through the power of the purse. Gunjan? Can I add one comment? Yeah, can I add one yeah. comment? So firstly, you know, fully fully agree with the comments and I really liked the metaphor of the blue economy that Deborah talked about. I mean, that is spot on. We've got to think outside the box. And I think enough of thinking back, going back to the same rare earth metals and so forth. Let's look at fabricated synthetic world. And that was the, the whole genesis of thinking. Let's let's look at the ocean. You know, two thirds of the planet is that. How, do, how can we do to leverage to make it, you know, to solve some of the problems in front of us? Let's look at the full universe of things that we're doing. And as we do that, I'm positive by applying technology and entrepreneurship, there's answers to these problems. There's plenty of capital. And I think we cannot be waiting for the political systems to reform itself or public policies to come in. I think the answer lies in coming out with real practical solutions because that's going to change the game. Just like what, for example, Tesla has attempted to do in the, in the, in, in the, uh, electric cars uh, syndrome, but every other market, we could do something similar. And I think that's the the call to action, I would say, for entrepreneurs worldwide. And the policymakers, my view would be that they should be listening to the entrepreneurs, they should be listening to the businesses that are making the change and creating an environment where you recognize by 2030, either you do it or you're done. I mean, there, there is no plan B here. There's only one planet, unfortunately. So that's the reality. Can my can we I, lost our moderator? No. Yes. No. Okay, he's back. Stephen, are you here? I'm not sure. Yes, you are. I can hardly right. I can hardly hear. His connection is very unstable, unfortunately. Right. We we can hear you very well. So what okay. no. is <clears throat> I want to bring this this is talk to many CEOs around the world who are under tremendous pressure from their shareholders and uh, stakeholders. How do they think about the, the environment in which they have to build their business and grow under this tremendous, tremendous pressure to transition and have their okay? Something that does not bring profits right away. What is the thinking in the boardrooms about that? I, I must say, I didn't understand you were breaking up. I'm sorry. Um, could you share with us uh, what is the thinking among corporate leaders? Vis a vis the pressure from shareholders to improve How do you remain competitive while investing in sustainability? I think you see, you will see a big shift in uh, some of the corporate sector. I'm looking partly at the finance sector, insurance companies, the pension funds who will see a shift in regards of uh, their customer behavior. Because if you're a pensioner, you want to know whether your pension increases global warming or decreases global warming. And most pension funds cannot yet 100% tell you where they have and where their assets are invested. And I think that is going to be much, much more important. We are going to arrange a round table of the big financial institutions banks, asset management institutions in the Vatican to discuss with them 
what is their responsibility in regards of these issues. And uh, the same has happened three years ago where the, the, the CEOs of the big uh, fossil fuel companies were in, uh, in the Vatican. And uh, I think uh, that is so important. The other thing is that I find so crucial is personal behavior. You know, we can talk about the corporate sector, we talk about the big boys, the, the big industries, etc. but what to do, what can people actually personally do? And uh, that's why we are very closely involved with grassroots in regards uh, Fridays for Future, the youth, but also people, the communities. We work closely with the trade unions. We work closely again with faith groups because we feel it's very important. They have a very strong voice. And uh, I think that also is important to help people let's say, analyze their own behavior in regards of consumption, in regards of uh, the way that they travel, the way that they live. And I think it has to start there as well. Corporate sector has to play its role, but we have to make sure that we reach everybody individually and to help them understand the issues and to also give them some guidance in what they personally can do. Thank you. That's, that's a very important dimension. We're coming to the end of our panel, but I wanted to uh, close it with an invitation to all of you who can stay in touch and happy to continue this conversation offline. But also, there's an important question that several of you have brought up. How do you make the same policy kind of quality? allows you to compete and is recognized in the marketplace and the regulator just makes the experience. Um, we'd love to develop a few people like that. We welcome your contributions. Obviously, it will depend on sophisticated measurements and metrics, but also business because right now that is not well defined and uh, Many companies, especially mid-sized and smaller companies, who have something to offer, I find it very difficult to compete, especially internationally, uh, even if domestic conditions are fine. So let me uh, thank all of you for your participation, uh, um, extend to you an offer to continue this conversation. Uh, you can find us, uh, you have my contact information. Um, but that was a very productive discussion. And I hope that our host at Horasis appreciate your contribution. Th thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.